Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Bite Marks, a podcast Hello. by gamers for gamers about politics. Say hello, Callum. I already did. <laughs> and it was it. glorious. And welcome to our part two of theme one, right? Remember how we do this podcast? Every two episodes are united by a common theme. Last time, we talked about the terrible reality of Elon Musk's space ambitions uh, and the game <laughs> Elite uh, Dangerous. <laughs> this time, uh, I thought I'd keep the, the theme of horror going, but instead of talking about something that probably might happen, we should talk about something that is probably happening right now, and that is workplaces. Da, da, da. So Actually, I mean... If anything, that's something that's definitely not happening right now. <laughs> I guess I guess you're right. Uh, pandemic time is weird, um, and time is losing all meaning uh, in in a, in a lockdown. Let's just let's just put that one out there. Yep, uh, straight up. It, it so, has been March for a year. It, every every day of 2020 feels like a year, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what you just look at the news and you, you could see a fresh hell un unfolding and speaking of fresh hell oh, you see that's your problem <laughs> you're watching the news i get all my news from Geralt of rivery divery ah i see you're a get you're an actual gamer anyway friend. you're not a fake gamer like me uh so anyway let's let's <laughs> let's, let's let's uh let's talk about what we're here to talk about and that is let me let me set the scene. Imagine you are a twenty-something, slightly unathletic, socially anxious guy who's kind of nerdy, who doesn't really have a job, who's really anxious. Okay, when are you gonna start setting the scene? <laughs> and one day you get a uh, a letter telling you that you've been accepted for a job at the world's biggest company. Uh, what do you do? I I burn it and I kick the Amazon drone out of the sky. <laughs> well, that that's actually probably for the best uh, because that's exactly what happened to Brian Pasternak, who is the protagonist of the game Yuppie Psycho and the topic for today's uh, podcast. So uh. Yuppie Psycho, uh, which hits really close to home, <laughs> is the story of Brian Pasternak and his first day uh, um, at, at, at the corporation called Sintracorp, which is already off to a good start by having almost the word sinister in its name, uh, for no reason other than the fact that that is how corporations are named, like Wayland yutani uh, Umbrella Corporation, all of these, these are just meaningless names that are invariably going to unleash evil onto the world. Well, I mean... Wayland Utani is probably it was probably founded by someone named Wayland and someone named Utani. Well, uh, not to go all deep lore on you, but uh, originally the Wayland Corporation and the Utani Corporation were at odds with one another. But then they did that thing in capitalism where two companies stop competing and agree to form a, mo a monopoly. So then they oh, you mean a merger? Yeah, they merged. <laughs> uh, I I can't recall which company bought the other one out, but. That was definitely a merger, but we're 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 getting uh we're getting sidetracked. Maybe we'll talk about Wayland Yutani in a future episode. Set that <laughs> Good. <before shadowing. laughs> so Brian is living in a strange world. Um, I I should mention the game is developed by a uh, Baroque Decay. Uh, they also made the game Count Lucanor. If you're familiar with that one, then I've already no. kind of okay. Well, <laughs> it's a, a pixel art uh, adventure game about a young boy who's lost in the woods and he gets he gets enthralled under the mysterious Count Lucanor and I, I don't want to talk anymore for fear of violating a terms of service <laughs> but um, I mean so far this is not sounding very wholesome but continue uh, so so Brian gets a, a job offer from Centricor and importantly it doesn't tell him what the job actually is and Brian has no job and he lives at home with his parents, and he's a young dude who maybe has a degree, maybe he has student debt. He has a very uncertain expectation of life, and he doesn't have a lot of self-confidence. So He's just like a, a Gen Z kid. 
he really is. Um, <laughs> uh, down to the the fact that Brian uh, kind of does not really feel comfortable wearing a suit. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah. Tropes. <laughs> he has to, yeah, uh, Brian is wearing a suit that his mom bought for him at a supermarket, just to kind of indicate just like how. Like uh, I kind of like him already. He's like a, he's a really nice guy. Um, he's very polite and uh, he, he, he's very. Well, I'll, I'll get into it. But he goes to Central yeah. You thought his deviant arts account was gonna do so much better by now? <laughs> yeah, you know he's always thinking about starting that podcast. But yeah, he could never get. He could never get. I, oh, don't drink stuff like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, the 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 real joke is that this has all been a dream and uh you've been playing yuppie psycho the entire time uh, <laughs> oh god <laughs> yeah the, the the meta commentary is too real but anyway so he goes to central corp and uh he meets a bunch of characters who will become extremely important throughout the rest of the game uh, and who i will use as a vessel to discuss uh issues that i think are interesting about the game uh but needless to say um he finds out what the job is in the coolest way possible. He goes right up to the CEO's office and walks in in like a visceral scene. Picture it, there's blood everywhere. There's trails of blood on the walls. There's uh, a giant message scrawled in blood that just says, kill the witch. And laid out on a perfectly polished desk is a document that is a contract that, that Brian has to sign. So, that is Brian's job. Brian is here at this massive mega corporation to do a thing that does not seem a massive mega corporation needs, and that is to kill a witch. And at first, it, Brian thinks this is maybe a joke. Maybe someone is playing a prank on him. That maybe uh, who isn't cancelled? Uh, Shane Dawson, he's cancelled. Uh, I guess. Does it? Logan why does it matter if they're cancelled or not? <laughs> this doesn't see. This is a sinister corporation. We can put bad guys in there. I, I, I guess like the the clone of Logan Paul and Shane Dawson shows up and it's like it's a prank, bro. No, that doesn't happen. So that was a very far length to go for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so that's where the game starts. If you sign the, the the contract, you will officially be inducted into Centricorp, and you will then have to do your first day at the job, which is to kill the witch. Uh, Yuppie Psycho describes itself as a business-themed survival horror, and that is really a perfect uh, theme. It has a lot more in common with a game like Resident Evil, in in some respects, uh, than it does like a game than it does like a, a game like a, a Office Tycoon Simulator or you know Video Game Tycoon Dev or something like that. Games that replicate you know office environments, and I, this is really interesting. Uh, but before I start like really talking about it, uh, I do want to mention. You can just get an ending. The game has multiple endings. You can just get an ending by leaving, <laughs> which, which honestly, more games should that is have the that best. feature. Uh, you just. End I wanted to like, ask. You said. Um, you said if you sign. I was about to be like, can you not sign? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can. You can look at this whole situation and be like, uh, actually, no thanks. I think I'll go work at Burger King or whatever the fast food equivalent is, and you could just leave. Uh, and honestly, no thanks. I'm gonna just you know give grad school another shot. <laughs> Maybe I should write my thesis. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I just had a really good idea for a mixtape. <laughs> okay, so uh, I I have to mention there will be spoilers for Yuppie Psycho. So if you're the kind of person who yeah. really cares about that, this is you go play the game and come back. Um, there there is a link to yeah. the Steam page. Uh, it sometimes goes on sale. It might go on sale because of Halloween, you know? So uh, look out for that. Bookmark this video and then come back to, like, circle around. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, put it on the to-do list in a typical corporate fashion. Back up. Uh... <laughs> so uh, I, I thought I'd give a brief synopsis of the story and then I'd hey. jump into talking about, like, the stuff. So I mentioned there are characters. So let's talk about some of the characters. So... Uh, the floor. The game is divided into a number of floors, and on each floor is a theme. And um, you start the game by going up to floor five, which is like the most normal of the the floors. Which sounds strange, but it'll make sense in a moment. And you get to a cubicle, and you meet your coworkers, uh, a lady called Marty Sosa, who is kind of this goth girl, uh, but like goth in the sense that you know she 
she's not like gonna style herself she's gonna be wearing really dark clothes and have really terrible bags under her eyes and be afraid of everything <laughs> and talk about like creepy pastas and a guy named so she's over goth yeah <laughs> she's guy... like what the, a, a group of 30 year old executives thinks goth people are like yeah yeah actually that's that's a, that's a good example uh and then there's hugo who is actually probably a 30 year old executive he's like this pudgy guy who's always making jokes that your dad probably would make you know like a hardly working or working hard kind of joke you know that kind of guy so okay <laughs> yeah you you told that joke wrong first because <laughs> in, in your in your version it's hardly working or working hardly which doesn't make sense but uh, continue you philistine <laughs> I didn't say I, I'm not the funny one, all right? I'm the one who does 300 pages of notes uh, when, when, he does a, uh, when he does a video. I'm not the one here to crack jokes. That's your job, mister. Uh, Aha. So, yeah, um, you will also meet the company's AI called Sintra, who is this anime girl, I guess, anime robot uh. girl, because, of course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> why? Um, and she will give you like the introduction you will photocopy your face because of course you do and then the game will start so what you what you will do is you will generally speaking visit a floor accomplish some kind of task because this is an adventure game and then that will progress the story uh to kill the witch and to find out what that actually means who is actually uh the witch and um you know what what that means for the company um and, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's I think, uh, a fairly interesting um, sort of dynamic because... Uh, well, a, well, hmm? I wanted to ask, is it like survival horror yeah. or um, is it like action horror? Okay, so Brian is, I said he was unathletic, so he can run for like three seconds before he has to, <laughs> before he has to stop and take a take a You break. know, take a break and eat a sausage roll, I get that. Actually, uh, actually now that you mention it, the game's health system is food-based. Uh, uh, so uh, it is. It is survival horror. There are enemies. In what the game. game's health system is not food based? <laughs> you you can't hurt them really, except for a couple of exceptions. Um, mostly, you run away and hide from them. Um, oh, okay. So it's just like survival horror puzzle something. So it's yeah. more Silent Hill than Resident Evil. Well, uh, I, I'll, I'll get to that. But um, the original uh the way that you it also has a, a a checkpoint system that relies on a consumable item um so Ugh, you have no. these, uh, yeah uh, uh, <laughs> yeah you have mm, mm, you have ink blocks like not not ink blocks uh, sorry cartridges and you use cartridges to make photocopies and that's how you save so in order to save the game you need to find a working photocopier put ink into it and then have a, an item called witch paper that allows you to save so uh, yeah. Oh, we learned this lesson with Dai Katana. <laughs> you don't have consumable save items, because I'm presuming there aren't enough for you to save any time you want. Well, uh, I would argue that that is actually thematically very relevant, because this is a game about office drudgery, and what is more uh, tedious than having to fill out this, to, to do paperwork in, basically, in order to save the game? Um, yeah, I get that, but also this is a video game, and at some point I'm going to need to go to the bathroom, and I don't want to have to fight through eight more levels <laughs> there is a, to get uh, the there save is a checkpoint system. There is a checkpoint system, so it's not it's not too bad. But if you die, uh, generally speaking, it will you you'll, you'll lose quite a lot of progress. Um, but there <sighs> is a checkpoint system that will save you at the current sort of floor. Where you're at. This is why we invented autosave. <laughs> it it it's a. Uh, I, I would argue. Well, I would say that from my experience, because I've played this game a couple of times. Um, sorry, you're breaking up a little oh, bit. Sorry. Uh, I I would uh, say from my experience that the game is generous enough with the health items that saving is never really a problem. Uh, usually, oh, okay. when you die, it's because you died to like an instant kill death trap, and the game will set you back to before mm, the death trap. Okay. Mm, okay, no, but that's... I was about to be like, oh, so it balances it by making it not super difficult. And no, but instant death traps are not a challenge. 
<laughs> That's well, the developer slapping you in the face every couple of hours. <laughs> well, this is also a short game. Uh, I never. I, I. I will make the claim. I don't think this is maybe the best design game. I think there are areas that it could be improved on. But w w what what I find so compelling is the story. So even if there are parts of it that are let's say frustrating, uh, I also think they are in some cases redeemable. Um, well, what do you find compelling about the story? Okay, so let me, let me. so firstly, uh, number one, Brian is completely unable to grasp the reality of the situation. Um, he's always constantly, at, at least initially, he's always uh, of the idea that this is a joke. Everything around him looks normal, like there are just office workers. You know, he meets this girl called uh, Kate Hicks and she's like, oh, I have a degree in disaggregated analytics and I'm going to do, you know, this thing. And he's like, OK, well, I completed high school, so I guess we're working in the same office. <laughs> <laughs> and initially, very early on, it doesn't really seem like anything is weird or wrong until you meet the first boss in the game. Right. So this is this is really I like it, it does this kind of thing where it's like it. You, it plays with, it, it very much blends like Silent Hill. Silent Hill, it probably is like maybe 10%, 20% Resident Evil with the mechanics of like, you know, items and you can combine items together. Like for example, this, uh, the, the game is based on healing with food. So if you take bread and cheese, you can make a sandwich and that heals you more well, than the individual components. <laughs> if you take bread and cheese, you can make a calzone. There is pizza in the game and that is the best healing item. Um, of course, it, it, uh, and you can. You interns can, uh, love their pizza. <laughs> Those dang interns and all their pizza. Um, I actually, there. I've never actually used a pizza to heal. I've almost always played the game healing with like the low level items because I'm always like, I'll need this for later. And the game is not never too difficult that I feel like I need to use the pizza. Uh, so the eternal game is paradox. Yeah. But what if I need it later? <laughs> uh, yeah, like I said, there there are ways that it could be designed better. But um, anyway, back to the story. So, you Brian resists this idea that he has to kill the switch. He has no idea. Like this is a fairy tale to him, until he has to do the first uh, like office task, and that is he has to go into one of the other offices to talk to to, to find someone. I think it is, or to to, to to do something fairly trivial. And what is in that office but a horrific scene. There are people tied up, played, dismembered parts everywhere in this weird, dimly lit, derelict office. And there's a guy in a chair and he's strapped to the chair and he can't like talk, so he's muffled. And um, you, you have to like move him. And there's a thing that's moving around you <coughs> that you don't know what it is. And then as you start moving this guy through the space, you know, this guy in the chair, because he's an obstacle that you have to move around. And Brian is like, oh, sorry, dude, I'm just, I'm just moving you. He doesn't think to like, like undo the, the duct tape over this guy's mouth, but he just like pushes him along. And then you see what it is in the office. And it is this guy who's insane. He's like foaming at the mouth. He's got a, a filing cabinet taped to his back and he's crawling on his hands and legs like an animal making these deranged noises. And that's that then you run away from him and you have to escape and he kills the guy in the chair obviously and then brian meets hugo and hugo is like did you go on a coffee break yet brian you shouldn't work too hard and that's like it's it's such interesting cognitive dissonance because Ooh. because no one else seems to be aware that all this stuff is going on but unlike yeah. Silent hill where the entire location you know uh has this idea that you know it's all like this weird eldritch thing and everyone's seeing their own different thing this is just an office. This is a very familiar space, you know. Um, mm, it 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 hits that perfect uncanny, yeah, sort of it's, vibe. It's like one moment you're collecting pencils and you know, g grabbing paper and stuff like that, making coffee, and then the next moment you're running for your life from this weird, creepy, weird. I I, I will say the enemy design is really good. The boss design is really good. Um, because it it's very uncanny. It's very unsettling, but it's all based on like familiar stuff. Mm. So I do just want to say this uh, as an interesting point. If you were to experience that, it would be crazy, right? If yeah. you were to work <laughs> in an office and uh, suddenly it's a horror movie. But consider the fact that we are so you're so immersed in this game that you forget that you're playing a video game. 
Like, it doesn't matter if it's real or not. It's just the next thing you have to do. Hmm. But the game makes you think, like, it does matter if it's real or not. And that is, that is a great segue into the first big sort of point that I wanted to bring up. And that is, uh, office work is actually deeply psychologically damaging in a lot of ways, right? So as, you know, when Brian escaped from this guy uh, and, you know, he starts to piece together a little bit of clues. Sintra is also kind of helping him because Sintra wants him to kill the witch for some reason. He doesn't know why. Um, you know, Brian is constantly confronted with this idea, like, is this how a corporation, how is, how is this, like, normal? How are the people just doing their, you know, their business? And a lot of people t- seem to have this idea that, like, you know, office work is inherently sort of, like, better. Like, no one wants to be a field worker. Everyone wants to be, like, an office worker, right? Yeah, no sense, one wants to be blue color. We yeah, all no want that blue color. color. Um, but in some sense, um, that is true. Uh in many ways, a lot of office workers do have it a lot easier than, you know, many sewer workers, janitors, and so on and so forth. But uh, what is often kind of ignored is that there is an immense psychological toll that is placed on you if you are an office worker, because office work is very dehumanizing. You know, at least if you are, uh, I, you know, I'm not trying to glamorize or valorize any kind of position. I think all work is valuable and all work has its place. But, you know, if you're doing office work, a lot of that stuff that you're doing is completely meaningless, you know? A lot of, like, it'll come up later, uh, but a lot of the people in the building are just doing stuff that they think they should be doing. No one actually yeah. knows what, they're sh- what they should be doing. Hugo, your, like, your boss, your boss who is, like, your office manager, he doesn't really tell you to do anything. He doesn't even know what he's doing himself. He's just typing away at a computer and somehow stuff is happening. And I think that is really interesting. I mean, it's, half of most businesses are just like data entry. Yeah, it's uh, you know? spreadsheet farms and all that kind of stuff. It's not even like it's not necessarily going to change how the business operates if you don't enter this data. It's just kind of useful, I guess. Yeah, it's uh, it's this idea that the business is is this it, at a, at a certain scale, a, a corporation becomes an entity that is fundamentally removed from a lot of the things that it actually like would we think of like work or or value being generated that's like actually a a good point um and brian has this weird moment where it's like okay i don't want to do this anymore and then you know he realizes but wait i have to do this i don't have a job (laughs) because here's the thing the society of yuppie psycho has a class system right so so like society (laughs) but even more explicit you see brian is a g class um the g stands for good (laughs) no i joke um uh, because (laughs) because brian is a g class he actually has your position in society dictates where you are going to be in like what jobs you can do what wealth you can accumulate so on and so forth and so brian had to take one of the reasons why brian took this job is because a g class like him could never get work at a company like Centricorp, which is oh. supposed to only hire like A class and above, right? Oh shit, I read a book with a similar idea to this, except they decided your like social standing through exams. Well, you know, it's funny that you mention it. One of the characters, uh, a, a woman by the name of Kate Hicks, the, the lady that you meet, she's very friendly. Ryan has a crush on her. He's, fr- he's way too oh. awkward to admit it. Yeah, it's it's... It's, it's I mean, he's like a geek and she's a, a goth girl. No, 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 no. That's, that's Marty. Uh, Kate is oh. like a... She's like the preppy... You, you know, the preppy girl in the university class who's like in the front row and she's got all of her notes. You know, that... Oh my god, yeah. wait. Is this just the video game version of Peep Show? <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> You've never watched... Emilio, what are you even doing with your life, man? I'm making a podcast with you. <laughs> God. Um, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, you can chastise me for it later. But anyway. I absolutely will. Uh, she did like six exams, and that's how she got to work at uh, Centricorp. So it, it is this idea that if you can prove yourself, you, you get merit. But like, there's very obviously a, a, a lot of flaws with that. And that brings me to the next character, and that is Chapman. Uh, Chapman is another guy you meet. Actually, most of the characters that you meet in the story, you will meet in the lobby of the 
of, of the office. So Chapman is uh, an example of, I, I think, like a textbook picture of how we think people who are like white collar workers, a lot of them are. Because Chapman is like apparently a high class worker. He, it, when you start talking to him initially, he's like, hey, you know, good to meet you. Ooh, that's a nice suit. Who made it? And da 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 da. But then when you tell him, oh, you know, I got this at a supermarket, he's like, wait, 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 what social class are you? And the minute you tell him, he instantly changes. He instantly drops all pretenses of being nice. He berates you. He insults you. Um, he's not nice to you at all. <laughs> Is he like the CEO? No, no, no. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a new employee, but he's of a higher social class. What a dick. Yeah, he's a terrible person, actually. Um, and... Uh, you know, just to talk about him, uh, later on, uh, well, actually, the, one of the first jokes in the game is that Chapman is like, hey, you know, I, unlike you losers, I'm going to go places. And then he gets in the elevator and he, he is uh, ride, the, the lift stops at floor two. Uh, and in, in, in this world, the floor indicates like your social standing. So he ends up at floor two, but you go straight all the way up to the CEO's office, uh, which is a very <laughs> funny joke. <laughs> uh, you know, for the it sounds like it's for the for the for the viewer. Um, but you meet Chap uh, Chapman later on um, in the game, and um, he's stuck in the floor. And uh, maybe this is a good time to describe the floors. So each floor in the office, there are a bunch of them, uh, ha is different and has a theme. So floor five is the um, like the hub area, right? It's the hub area for the world. Um, it's uh, where you and uh, most of the characters will be. There's no like paranormal stuff really going on, you know, for the most part. Um, <laughs> but uh, floor four is where Hicks works. It's like a data, it's like a cubicle farm. It's literally a cubicle farm. There's rows and rows and rows of cubicles. And if you approach anyone, right, they'll attack you. Like the any 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 of the person who looks like a zombie, right? These people hunched over at computers typing away stuff that they don't really understand. If you get close to them, they'll attack you. Uh, and the uh, HR literal department is there. <laughs> uh, and the HR department is staffed by ladies, but the ladies don't have heads. They have these big, luscious red lips, which is a metaphor. Uh, I'm I, I'm uh, assured. <laughs> um, For like kissing it better. No, they're, they, they, they spit. Oh. They spit poison out. Oh. Uh, so it's like... Is it maybe... It, it, it's... I, I, it's I, maybe it's a mes metaphor for like office gossip or something like that. Uh, I was going to say like sexual assault, but okay. It, it, yeah, it's also possible. It's commentary on like the sexualized nature of women in workplaces. Like even though men and women are supposed to be held to an equal standard in the workplace. Women are still expected to put on makeup and stuff like that, that men are not expected to do. And it's, it's a unfair mm. social standard. And yeah. Um, then if you go to floor three, that's where uh, the IT department is. And there's a guy called uh, Inay Doshi, who uh, is unsurprisingly an Indian IT guy, <laughs> uh, who uh, does not actually... Oh. <laughs> he's actually Doji is actually a really cool guy. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about him a little bit later. Uh, but he's the only person in the IT department because all of the other IT techs are dead. Um, they keep getting killed to the monsters, I guess. Yeah, it's weird. Um, and then on floor two is uh, a place called the herd, where it is literally just all the interns just shuffling mindlessly in a big herd, trying to. Uh. <laughs> trying to they catch, are cattle. I get yeah, it. They're cattle. They're trying to catch the attention of a, a superior so they'll get promoted. And guess what Chapman is? He's stuck because he can't pass the test. So what do, what do you do? You lord it over him and Chapman's like, hey, you know, I'll give you money if you pass the test for me. And or you cut out like a bunch of... Oh, sorry. Uh, well, Chapman is, is down on, on, on the second floor and he can't pass the test to get promoted. So... Uh, you can offer to pass the test for him, but you know uh, only if he pays you money. Um, and uh, he's condescending to you the entire way, despite the fact that he needs your help. You know, and I find it very interesting because uh, Chapman is basically a consequence of wealth perpetuating wealth. He's an entrenched wealthy person whose only utility is using his money to retain his money. Right? He has no skills. He is a rude, terrible person. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, later on, uh, there's an office party that gets thrown for Hugo, 
and Chapman uh, decides to make all the sandwiches and he burns all of the sandwiches. He wastes all of the ingredients. How? I don't know. How do you burn a sandwich? <laughs> He's like, here, I'll make a toasted sandwich. And then he burns eight, san- like, eight sandwiches in a row making them, which is ab- abominable to me um, because that's all the health, Callum. The eight sandwiches is more health than you'd ever need in the entire game. And he just okay. burns all of them. <laughs> well, I mean, also, that's an argument against uh, your greed <laughs> stop holding your sandwiches Emilio I I eat the candy let that rich kid burn them <laughs> um, it's funny actually now that you mention it because when I play the game the game gives you money you can do tasks and get money uh, and you do get money like for doing tasks from like your job but I never spent any of it because in my mind I was playing it from the perspective of there's no way Brian has ever seen this much money before. If I was him in this situation, I would never spend a cent unless I absolutely had to. Um, I mean, what do you spend money on in the game? Uh, you can buy um, items that uh, help you survive. So you can buy pencils that you can use to disarm mines. You can buy uh, paper that you can use to save, although it's very expensive. Um, you can buy uh, items that make other items better. Like, for example, um, you can buy... Um, uh, What's it? Uh, glow sticks that help you like navigate in the dark, um, or you can buy uh, ink cartridges that you can use on the printer, a photocopier, so that you can save and so on and so forth. Um, so I, like no sword, no no weapons. <laughs> uh, Brian, okay, well, what's even the bloody point then? <laughs> Brian's weapon is his briefcase, and he never once lets go of his briefcase in the entire playthrough, which is very impressive, given that there's basically just pizza and <laughs> candy bars and just like food in there that, that's Dude, why. <laughs> it always blows my mind when i see people in games and movies run with like backpacks and briefcases and shit hmm. because i i have been a student who has used a backpack before and it is impossible to run with that shit on it every it would just flop and this is unless you've got a very tight fit it would just flop around it, it's very cumbersome yeah but, uh, I'm, I'm presuming that they sew it into their skin. Well, Brian can only run for like three seconds anyway at a time, so... Eh. Oh. He, he, it's because he's left heavy. Yeah, he, he's all... I think he, he, I think he holds the briefcase in his left hand, if I recall correctly, but I, I could be mistaken. Anyway, um, so Brian eventually discovers that the company has had a history of hiring witch hunters to kill the witch, only for all of the witch hunters to mysteriously disappear. Uh, and that leads him to something called the Hexenhammer. Or rather, the Hexenhammer leads him to something uh, of the company's history. Uh, the Hexenhammer, Hexenhammer is a book on how to kill witches, written in the 14th century, which this company happens to have for some reason. And again, it's this weird is it ever explained what they have it? No, no, it's this weird juxtaposition. The company has a library, right? They have an actual library, but weird. it's never explained as to why they have this big library. What's going on, you know? It's this interesting juxtaposition because the space inside the building does not make sense. Like, uh, there is a cemetery inside the building. And uh, the more you uncover about the building, the less familiar the space becomes, which I think is interesting because it's uh, it of being very familiar. Here's an office. It's purgatory. Yeah. <laughs> well, They're in purgatory. <laughs> well, uh, we could, we, we'll get to that. Um, I, that's Wait, I did I guess right? Are they actually in purgatory? You have to tell me if I guessed right. No, th- but there are demons. There, there is, there is devil iconography. There is a very heavy theme about like. Yeah, uh, that's no fun. But there's uh, devil iconography in everything nowadays. <laughs> the devil is a hot property. If 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 the devil Ha-ha. was around, he'd have stocks in Apple. You know that kind of thing. I mean, I'm pretty sure he does. Does Jeff Bezos have stocks in Apple? <laughs> Who knows? Maybe. Um, so yeah, Brian has to. He, he finds the book, uh, and it, when you find the book, you go into a library. Uh, you have to fight another boss, which is this weird spider creature that is laying eggs that are also mines. It's it's very trippy. Uh, but you basically fight the spider creature by pushing stuff over its mines and forcing it to run away. You never actually kill it, right? I don't think anything actually really dies except for you in this game. Uh, but once you find the book, uh, then you get told 
Brian, you need to go find a weapon called the Anthemy or something. I I'm mispronouncing it. That's a weapon that can kill the witch. It's a weird sacrificial dagger. Don't 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 explain how we we have a dagger like that, but we do somewhere in the building. And, I mean, I've seen weirder things in buildings. Eh, you know, there's a there's a um, a part in the building which is just an art gallery. So I mean, yeah, it's. <laughs> Uh, uh, oh, it's purgatory. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, if we can talk about that a little bit later, but uh, Brian eventually uh, he would go on to find the dagger and you know do a bunch of stuff. Uh, but he he gets called to deal with a guy called Colonel Dupont, who is a French hussar cavalryman who rides a horse. I think his horse is named Marat. Uh, or Durand or something like that and he gives you a team building exercise <laughs> yeah it's like uh, and this okay. brings me to the, the second point which is like the ridiculous nonsense of like corporate guru culture uh, because here, oh, yeah. here is this guy they've hired him as a quote unquote motivational consultant he's completely insane he rides around swinging a horse on uh, uh, swinging a horse uh, <laughs> swinging a sword on horseback and giving nonsense orders to people as if he's like a French cavalry uh, general and he you know if you don't do his tasks correctly I think his horse will kill you um, um, what? yeah <laughs> he gives you the he, That's not how the French cavalry work <laughs> he uh, leads you in this weird motivational chant and I think you take damage every time you get an answer wrong so if you get enough answers wrong you die um, I, I've never taken damage when I've, I've done it <laughs> because I'm, I'm i'm very i'm very obsessive like that but you've uh, just got you've got the skills to pay the bills i can remember basic things about uh information that i get fed uh in a tech yeah that's room. skills that, that is what we <laughs> in the gaming community call skills so uh inadvertently dupont is the the guy who actually uh brings brian and and uh uh Kate together because he's like go make a friend and then Brian goes to become <laughs> friends with this lady <laughs> yeah I know it's so funny <laughs> come here boy go on we'll make a friend yeah it's weird Brian is this very strange and awkward it's very funny uh, uh. and he's like hey I'm I have to make a friend and she's like okay let's be friends also, can you help me with, you know, tasks? She works in the hive, which is the, the floor floor, the, the cubicle farm. And um, then, then the, one of the most memorable parts about the game, uh, I think, is fighting the dot matrix. Uh, so uh, eventually, you after you've done a bunch of stuff, right, you eventually go back into the hive. I, I'm, I'm playing fast and loose with the story here because the story is, you know, broadly speaking, uh, inconsequential like the day-to-day -day, the minute-to-minute -minute stuff is kind of you know meaningless uh, for our yeah yeah the wider sort of stuff that's interesting so Ine tells you that you should be afraid of this thing called the dot matrix and you should get out of the hive at a certain time that's when it shows up and while, while you're exploring the hive you find these weird bloated corpses and a lot of poison gas right and these people who've had their heads exploded um, so once you come back to the hive uh, at, at, at a, fission, a sufficient point, you encounter the dot matrix, and it is one of the coolest enemies that I've seen. It is a dot matrix furniture that walks around on four hands. It's yeah, it's a silent. Wait, hill. what? Yeah, imagine a printer, right? That a printer is a square, right? Now imagine yes. that growing out of the printer in all four directions are big hands. Big human hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it fucking cartwheels towards you. It crawls like a spider on the floor. It's really creepy. And it makes I imagine if I saw it, it would be, but I'm just like picturing it's got a circle of hands around it and it rolls everywhere jauntily. <laughs> it makes like a weird uh, printing sound. Uh, and if it catches you, it, it basically tries to blow you up with a. Um, like a weird pincer thing that it has. It's, it's really... Oh, like, you mean it just like slams its lid? No, no, no. It, it like grows a spike or there's a spike that shows up and like tries to burst you like a bubble. It's uh, 
it's really freaky and you can't hurt it right so you just have to run away from it uh the entire time and it chases you down into the hive um and uh, you fall into this pit actually it you and it fall into a pit uh of toxic chemicals because of course you do uh and it turns out that uh you find the body of one of the witch hunters <laughs> uh so it turns out that all the people who have been killed one of the reasons why there's so much bad energy in the office is that all the people who die because of all the monsters that are roaming around they just get thrown into a hole uh by some unknown force and their bodies have been decomposing and pr producing this toxic miasma that has been infecting uh, some uh. Of the other people and turning them into like these weird zombie creatures as well it, it's it's very gross but uh once you drain the so, uh, it's like a metaphor for dumping toxic waste yeah once you drain the pollution because lord knows where you send it um you find the body of a witch hunter who uh gives you like your next big clue in you know how to deal with a witch um and uh cuz he you know you, you you figure out ah someone's been killing the witch hunters that's why no one has been able to kill the witch because maybe the witch is killing the witch hunters and you know Brian's going to look out because uh you know for 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 dangerous reasons and you know but you find like bits and pieces yeah um but then everything kind of comes to a head like a lot of the climax of the story really comes to a head when you have to go to Hugo's birthday party so okay wait no you were you were dropping in and out here okay. Okay. like a uh, paratrooper so so um a lot of the like you know you you find a, a clue from the corpse of a, a witch hunter that leads you know a little bit more into the story uh, but it all kind of comes to a head when you get to the uh Hugo's birthday party because it turns out it's Hugo's birthday and that's where all of the characters that you've met in the story thus far gather in the break room at in the cafeteria and um you you know there you're going to throw up a party there's balloons and there's cake and Chapman has burnt all the sandwiches uh <laughs> and uh, someone put alcohol in the punch okay of course it's a party <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah you, it's, you yeah. Unconsensually dr get your co-workers drunk. It's a party. I think it. I, if I recall correctly, it's either uh, Chapman or I think another character named Jenna who uh, spiked the punch. And these are like more, more like the party people because Chapman wants to party. Chapman's Chapman's the kind of guy you could imagine would do cocaine in like an '80s movie in like Die Hard. He's the guy who was doing cocaine. In the... Oh, a white person. <laughs> okay, now I got to you. To be fair, yeah. he's wearing a he's wearing a suit and tie, so it, it it's classy at that. Oh way. man, what? No, don't you bring suits and ties into this? <laughs> I refuse to let them be ruined by the corporate world. Suits look great. All right, so you're going to do the you're going to do the thing, right? Brian is feeling good about himself. He's got a plan to deal with the witch, more or less. You know, he's figuring things out. He's making his way downtown, walking fast. Um, and he also, you know, uh, is making friends. You know, Kate, uh, Kate, I think at this point is like, hey, you know, do you want to go on the roof later and have a coffee? Because I guess that's what normal people want to do. Um, and Brian's like, yeah, I'll do that. Woo! He starts, you know, getting, getting crazy. Uh, and then this is where everything basically really goes to hell. Because previously you, you, you were dealing with isolated bouts of, like, weirdness. You were dealing with... Um, the odd monster in a weird place that was out of the way from other people and you know that kind of stuff but here this is when uh the witch attacks like the witch Oof. manifests in the party as a horrific demon creature and everything goes insane uh the oh, like people start bleeding out of random orifices um these weird shadow things start to manifest. People start spasming, you know, having like these weird freakouts. Uh, and uh, basically, the witch is there to kill Brian because, you know, if you have to escape from the room. Uh, and um, Ine basically sacrifices himself <laughs> to let you escape because he fixes the elevator that allows you to escape. And then you get chased up by, by the witch because, surprise, surprise. Hugo knew about the witch too. <laughs> uh, Hugo figured out that Brian was there to kill the witch. And once Hugo figured that out, that's when the witch attacked, right? Um, so Hugo is the witch. 
No, 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 no. It, it's a, a little bit more involved than that. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But uh, Hugo, once well, Hugo figures well, it out... It may be better to get to that sooner rather than oh, later. Right. We're about 40 minutes into the podcast. Right. We, I, right. I, we do want to keep this under an hour. All right. So uh, once you escape, which you do so, by, by the way, with the help of a union, like one of the un- un- unambiguously heroic characters in the game is a union organizer who shows up to save you from a demon. That's props. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It, yeah, it is awesome. Um, but then once you get back into the building, you know, because Brian's like, I can't leave my friends to die. I have the determination. I've learned the power of friendship. I've talked to a girl, you know, you know, that kind of stuff. Brian. And I liked it. Yeah, and he liked it. Yeah. Uh, he drank some of the punch. He probably got a little bit tipsy. He goes back and then like the entire story begins to unravel. So I'll sort of conclude with, uh, basically wrap it up. So here's what's actually been happening at Centricorp. Um, the Centricorp co- Corporation doesn't really have like, it doesn't produce anything. It is a financialization corpora- uh, corp- uh, corporation. So it trades in stocks and stuff like that. So it's all already, it, its value to society is really ar- arbitrary and kind of meaningless. But the founder of the company uh, made a deal with a witch, uh, a mystic, uh, entity, a spirit, if you will, to <coughs> get a child. And the child, uh, there was, you know, as with witches curses, there's always like, hey, you know, don't break these rules. Otherwise, you know, bad things will happen. And in this Okay, case, you have completely dropped out now. Ah, oh, damn it. Um, what was the last thing? You, you said remember? as I last, well, the last thing I remember was starting. Uh, but the last thing I heard was child. Ah, he wanted a child so from the witch. Child. So they, they, they went and did it. They, they wanted to adopt a child, quote-unquote, adopt a child, but they ended up uh, adopting a mystical, demonic, familiar w- w- creature, uh, a, a cat spirit, basically, like a, a, a girl that has cat ears that is magical. Uh, so a cat girl. Oh, yeah. it's Sintra. Yeah. Uh, and that uh, ended up bringing them good fortune, right? And that ended up producing a child who they called Ray. Now, as Ray and Sintra, uh, well, as Ray and the familiar were friends, eventually they had a falling out because Ray didn't want, you know, because the, 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 the two were bonded to one another and the familiar can't leave the office building, right? So she's eventually, you know, the child wanted to have friends outside of the office and so on and so forth. And then she leaves and this causes the magic to start going awry, right? But then it turned out that actually all of this was because of another demon. Yeah, this is a very anime storyline. Another demon had been tricking... Sorry, another demon? Another demon had been tricking the the witch familiar uh, into acting out and causing chaos, right? And the family, in desperation, killed the witch familiar, unknowing that they had that she had cast a spell to switch bodies with Rey, in, inadvertently killing their own daughter. And bringing a terrible misfortune onto the entire corporation. And the witch, the witch is actually this demonic entity that has been basically controlling the company by killing off any person in the company who becomes close to beco- becoming the CEO or becoming the ruler and basically sort of like puppeting the other employees into doing stuff and spreading its own influence. Uh, and so that is a great metaphor for just... If that doesn't make any sense, that's because a lot of corporate uh, structures don't really make sense. But really what I want to talk about is Hugo. So where does Hugo fit into this, right? You made the assumption earlier that maybe Hugo was the witch. That's not correct. Hugo is the character who's been basically killing the witch hunters. (laughs) Because what Hugo realized uh, is that if he can control the witch, he can control the company. And so the entire, uh, throughout throughout the game, at various points, Hugo has been trying to kill you because he suspects you of being the witch hunter, but he's trying to do it in secret. And he has had a hand in killing all of the other top executives so that when, um, you know, you fail to kill the witch, he'll become the CEO. And uh, Hugo is, I think, one of the most interesting characters. And one of the reasons why I wanted to make this podcast, because Hugo is also a fake. (laughs) Uh, The character of Hugo, uh, that's not his name, because it's revealed in flashbacks once you beat the game and see the multiple endings, that Hugo was a class R. Remember I said that Brian was a class G and he's like a relatively low class person, right? Hugo, uh, Callum, are you there? Ah, so technical, maybe I'm the one who's cursed by a witch. 
<sighs> wow. Thematic. Yeah, dang, that's that's really relevant. Um I went on a whole sc- <laughs> I went on a whole screed there about the actual story and uh, I had no idea that you were not even not even listening. I'm so sorry. No. I was totally listening and unt- I heard up until like a demon a second demon comes in and they're the actual thing and then anticlimactic and then the call dropped. Ah. Okay, uh, so maybe just edit out all of that stuff. Uh, yeah, totally. Are you okay, still recording? So, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still recording uh, from what I can see. OBS is still recording. So let me let me just sort of talk about like Hugo. I think Hugo is the important character here because there's this whole story around the witch and magic and corrupting the organization. But what's really interesting is Hugo because Hugo is a class R in the society that is structured uh, in the way that it is, uh, Hugo is someone who was born without a name. He just had a number, right? Uh, And if you think Brian is relatively low class, Hugo, he was basically a slave because what he was used for in the central corporation was cleaning up dead bodies. And one day he finds uh, an ID of a dead body that looks superficially similar enough to himself that he decides to steal that person's identity and climb up the corporate ladder. Ooh. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, and uh, that's what that's what he's been doing the in, throughout the entire game. Every time there's someone who's higher up than him in the corporate ladder, he's been using the the witch uh, to kill them, and he does that because he knew the last witch hunter uh, that tried to kill the witch and failed, and that g- guy gave him a dagger that could, the anthem that could kill the witch, and it also protects him from the witch's influence. So he's been shadow puppeting this whole situation. Um, the actual decline of the Centricorp is not really because, oh no, there's a magic demon. It's because people inside the corporation are using the mechanisms of the corporation to advance their own agendas and are producing these terrible situations. Because Hugo is the one who's been doing all of this, really. Um, he's been... So, yeah. would you say that this is a big metaphor for how corporations function generally? Yes. Uh, what I what I really wanted to what I what I find so compelling about Hugo is that Hugo is playing the game of capitalism exactly in the way that capitalism tells tells him it's supposed to be played. You know, he uses every advantage that he can get to climb up the ladder. Uh, he makes every decision that benefits himself. He uh, doesn't really think he's not really concerned about long term plans. He's not concerned about the stability of the corporation. He just wants to be the CEO and. That really mirrors the way that a lot of corporations are structured. You have a nebulous group of shareholders and top executives and legions of peons and and low-level workers. And between them, an army of middle managers who are desperately trying to climb up the ladder, you know, by stepping on everyone else uh, under them. And Yeah, and um, I think it also reflects upon the fact that he... (laughs) basically only succeeded in the system because of an immense amount of luck and incredibly ruthless tactics. Yeah, you know, it's worth it's worth pointing out, and this is sort of the second reason, is that even if you kill the witch, like you manage to resolve that whole storyline because the game has multiple endings, nothing changes. Centricorp continues to exist. It continues to have a CEO. It continues to do all of the things. At no point in the game does Brian ever question why he has to do this job why he has to get this kind of job and why his society is structured in the way that it is. He never once questions it. All he tries to do is survive from the day in and day out. And that really, um, you know, that really represents uh, for a lot of people their experiences with capitalism. You know, they can't really conceptualize of the system as anything because it's this vast, nebulous, almost eldritch entity that's around them. Uh All they, yeah, references. And all they can really do is survive it. Um, I mean, no... yeah, I guess no one has the time to decide whether this is right or wrong because you're too busy trying to live. And even and, and importantly, even if you do try to make good decisions, invariably, uh, it's the people who make the bad decisions that are all the ones that prosper. Because if you if you, if, you, if you, uh, according to some you know interpretations of well, according to some endings, Hugo can end up being the CEO and Brian just gets fired. That's that's what happens if Hugo ends up being the CEO. Brian gets fired because Hugo doesn't like him very much. Um, Is there an ending where Brian like overturns society and destroys the class system? 
Uh, there is an ending where he gets uh, to go to the roof with Kate and look at the sky. There's that ending. <laughs> okay, well, that wasn't exactly what I was talking about, even a, a little bit, but uh, cool. Well, Thank there you. Is a, if you fail to save all of your friends from the witch, uh, Brian will go home on the train looking very wistful, thinking, contemplating perhaps maybe that there's something wrong with the society in, in some respects, but that's not really... He never really offers any ability to think like beyond what he's doing. And that is very interesting because... So you really are just trapped in the corporate machine. Speak, that's very relevant because I have a quote from the game. Um, so in A Doshi, right, one of my, an interesting character, he, during the party, he actually busts out into a rave dance. He has like glow sticks that he, he could do like a dance with. It's really funny. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Um, he, he, he has, here's the quote. So, um, the corruption of the company uh, being like, uh, sorry, the, he refers to the corruption of the company being like a machine, having parts that do not function correctly, but are still working, keeping things running, but with no owner to actually report issues with its own functions. And uh, out of all of the characters in the game, he's probably the one that has the most acute sense of why everything is dysfunctional. But even he, who is capable of seeing all the dysfunction, can't meaningfully suggest any kind of change. because. The best ending, quote unquote, the best ending, uh, sees you resurrect Ray Sintra as a ten-year-old to become the next CEO, which is, oh, um, and you throw Hugo off the off the building. I get. Well, oh, sorry, you 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 either kill Hugo or he jumps off the building. Uh, it, it, okay, so is this just end of Evangelion? <laughs> because it's starting to sound an awful lot like. Like we're resurrecting rays and stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, you see, there, there's this interesting sort of parallel story. On the one hand, this game is a st story about the horrors of capitalism, about the horrors of office life, alienation, you know, these kinds of things. On the other, it's an anime story about spirits uh, and uh, revenge and magic. Uh, so yeah, maybe it is just Evangelion. Uh, I I I didn't get the secret ending where there was pro maybe Brian gets in the mech. <laughs> <laughs> well, knowing Brian, he wouldn't. Uh, yeah, he would he he would get sweaty. Brian does get sweaty a lot throughout the course of the game. Gross. I didn't need to know that, but thank you. <laughs> Hugo also gets sweaty. Hugo is uh, a very. I mean, guy. yeah, but like he's supposed to be the unassuming villain. It, I presume in the later levels he doesn't get sweaty. It was actually a very nice twist because uh, I kept thinking Hugo's the witch, Hugo's the witch, Hugo's the witch, and I never. And it, it it again talks to that idea about like this idea of Hugo's playing the game of capitalism because I never once realized oh Hugo's just a guy who's just doing what you know he's doing he's just playing the game as you know it's intended. The fact that and the reason he's doing this is because capitalism is amoral, right? It doesn't care about the morality of an action. It only really cares about the profitability of an action. And so if you have a choice between something that's good and something that's bad, the actual choice yeah. is the one that's profitable. And Hugo is just doing the stuff that's, you know, the profitable stuff. Um, well, um, I, I do really enjoy the mayor of Casterbridge-esque trope of assuming a different identity to succeed. That's one of my favorite tropes in any story. And I do like that Hugo used it to, like rides up in this class system and i think it's it's handled very well from what you're telling me yeah uh hugo you 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 get the sense that hugo is not you get yeah well you get the sense that hugo is more driven to this villainy by environmental factors rather than by innate sort of fact you know a genetic or like a cultural factor because he doesn't have a name he doesn't know his parents he's forced to do menial labor cleaning up dead bodies he doesn't really have any friends all he wants to do, and all he all he sees, all 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 that's around him is a corporate superstructure. And the only thing that makes sense to him from that perspective is climb the ranks, get power, be happy. And it. I mean, he's <laughs> he's almost a liberal <laughs> who is born with nothing and thinks like the American dream. If you work hard enough, you can become anyone. Yeah, you know, and uh, you get flashbacks to him as a kid because. The, the witch hunter that eventually gives him the anthememe, or at least knowledge of where to get the anthememe, uh, treats him, 
you know, kind of like with kid gloves. And Hugo's like, I want to be the CEO. And the guy's like, uh, uh, don't you don't you want to have like a cape and like pretend to fly? He's like, no, I want to crush my enemies. You know, it, it's, not, <laughs> it's <laughs> oh, I love this game. It's very fun. I I would recommend, you know, playing it or looking up a, a, walk, a, a playthrough if you're you know interested, because it does have really good imagery. It does have really good uh, moments where this is just a, a, a demonstration of why capitalism is bad, a visceral demonstration of it. But at the same time, you know, uh, as we as we said, it does have some bad design elements. Maybe uh, they should have maybe fewer healing items or maybe more heal. You know, you could have that kind of talk about the, the structure. But I think the story is very compelling. I find a lot of the characters to be very interesting. Um, Brian, I think, is really the character that you're meant to project into because he really doesn't have that much of a personality. Um, but the characters are... Well, yeah, him. he's like the link. He's the audience surrogate. Yeah, he's, he's, the, he's the guy who, who has to cross the threshold of the madness uh, because he never really uh, emotes all that hard, you know, which is kind of strange when you think about it because he's in these horrific situations and he's just like, oh, no, I guess I have to run away now. But then I have to go do the filing at three o'clock and then you're expecting a laugh track but mm. it he's 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 this audience surrogate but there are other characters you know marty is always interesting she's very very weird and esoteric and uh, if you uh really bother to go and play the game you can find these hidden tapes that will show you um weird found footage style indie horror clips and if you find all of them, you will get a secret link to a secret YouTube channel where all of them are held that I have the link to <laughs> because I'm weird like that. Okay. Um, um, no, I need to sleep. <laughs> yeah. So, again, just to just sort of wrap uh, everything up. Yuppie Psycho is... Well, um, before you do that, I want to say that I like the idea of this this incredible dissonance between your main character's emotions and the the characterization of the people around him it's very um infamous -y, almost where you you get to decide your character's actions based on their morality and yet the the people around you who are actually well written make you look so much more bland for having that choice yeah that's 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 a very good point and also in in some ways you know you have to give brian his own personality the way that i play, played him was like a really miserly, I'd never spend any money, I desperately tried to hoard all my resources. Uh, but you could very easily play Brian as a very laid, laid back, chill mm. office dude who's like, I'm just gonna buy everyone snacks at the cafeteria, you know, that kind of guy. Um, I'm gonna be on Reddit all day. <laughs> yeah, to be honest, okay. that's what Hugo's so, probably doing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in, in wrapping up of this episode, what would you, if you had to boil it down to one point, what would you say that Yuppie Psycho says about capitalism in games? Uh, capitalism is an alienating process, and its alienation makes it this eldritch entity. The more capitalism you have, the more unknowable it becomes. And uh, it has, and therefore, uh, its negative outcomes become worse and worse and worse while becoming less understandable uh, as time goes on. That, that's what I would say. What's your takeaway? Uh, my takeaway is that capitalism, capitalism is about individual survival when it should be about community survival. Ooh, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I thought you were going to make a joke about capitalism is about not microwaving your pizzas so that you can save them for later. <laughs> well, no, capitalism is about not burning, the, not letting the preppy kids touch the sandwiches. Ah, he burned eight sandwiches, Callum. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, thank you very much for watching. I'm once again. I'm Emilio. Uh, I have a, and I'm hydrated. And <laughs> you should watch Callum's uh, channel, Grim Monolith. Uh, you should watch my channel, The People's Pamphlet. Uh, good night, and we'll see you next time, everyone. Oh, uh, before we go, uh, if you have any suggestions for a topic that you want to put into the comments, please do. Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, feel free to suggest a theme. Uh, otherwise, we will just pick whatever we fancy, and uh, we'll hopefully see you next time. Uh, bye, everyone. Goodbye.